If people don't know you and you don't have a track record, they have no reason to have trust in you. You know, good scripts are good scripts, but it kind of isn't enough. And uh, there was a point where, you know, about three years into the process, you know, there'd been people on the project and then they'd lost interest. It was at a point where it was just me and Luke. And I said to him, look, no one cares about us. No one cares about this film. This is Filmmaker Stories podcast brought to you by JB Audio Post Production. JB Audio Post Production is a full service audio production facility in London. Get in touch for all your audio needs from recording voiceovers and podcasts to sound design and final mix for documentaries and feature films. Today's episode is a very special episode. If you follow me or the podcast on social media, you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, this is something I've been waiting for a long, long time. Today, the film Criminal Audition is being released in the United States and Canada. Have a listen. Have you always had this violent streak? You've got one dead, another in intensive care. If he doesn't wake up... No comment. You can't just say no comment to everything. You realise you only need to convince us you could commit murder. Welcome to your criminal audition. This is what we do. These satisfied customers are willing to pay you. You're not just going to be confessing to a crime. You're going to have to live it. Amazing. What do you think, being the expert? Or... It depends how far you're willing to go. Oh, well, she looks like she'd go all the way. <laughs> you're not pretending to be a criminal. You are one. This client, she's dangerous. I want to test drive those would-be murderers. My assistant and I will be eager spectators. Your assistant, he's here. We're here to shake things up a tad. Why are you here? Did you ever just stop and think? Maybe we weren't the bad guys. You're not pretending to be a criminal. I'll let one of you live if you kill the other. He failed. If you live in the United States or Canada, you are able to watch the film from today on Amazon Prime, iTunes, Comcast, and many other digital platforms. If you live in the UK, you will have to wait two weeks or so. It's going to be released on the 26th of October in the UK. I first met Sam when I mixed his short film some four or five years ago. I remember when I watched the film, I was so impressed by the quality of it, and I thought, I want to work with this director in the future. Luckily, Sam liked my work too, and he said, I'm about to shoot my first feature. Do you want to work on that too? The rest is history. I'm so pleased to see the film having the worldwide release. For the low-budget film like this, what Sam, Luke, and the rest of the team have achieved is phenomenal. Sam talks about his early experiences within the film industry as a script consultant, as well as his thoughts on film and the lessons learned whilst embarking on his thrilling first feature. Criminal Audition also stars Luke Kell, our previous guest from the series, so if you want to hear more from Luke, check out episode 3. But for now, here's Sam's story. How do I introduce myself at a party or a, or a networking event? And I would say that I'm a director and producer but then I do write as well. And, and you get this kind of, you know, I guess it's quite a British kind of self-effacing thing where you don't want to have, be too hyphenated in what you do. You don't want to be like, oh, I direct, because you, you, you've already opened with the top job that everybody wants. So then you go, and I do this, and I do this, but I do write, and by necessity, I've become a producer because no one else wants to produce your film, basically, so you've got to do it. And... Uh, I've really enjoyed learning about that and being a producer. I also do script consultancy and creative consultancy. So that kind of stems from when I was doing script reading and writing script coverage and doing development notes, which is kind of where I really learned a lot and was my first proper job in the industry, as it were, proper job. The first script reading job I did was for a website where people submitted their uh, scripts for free and were able to put it on a database and 
get feedback for it. And it was meant to be established as like the UK blacklist. Anybody who doesn't know the blacklist in the US is a list published every year of the best unproduced scripts. And usually the ones at the top are, you know, famous actors who've written scripts and already have agents and stuff like that. There's no real fairy tale to it. Uh, but this was intended to start a UK version of it. And so there was a lot, people could just submit anything. So I was reading scripts from anybody of all different shapes and sizes and it was just great to see what was out there. You know, just literally people throwing things at the wall and, and, and seeing what stuck. And then I started reading for a production company remotely and then eventually interned there and started working there. And uh, yeah, so I help people, give them notes, not so much a script editor, but just try and develop them for them and, and then... I also look at early cuts of features and things like that and give people uh, adv advice on that. And I really enjoy that because, to me, it's not exclusively just you making your film is not just the, all the work. It's also helping other people make films, and it's all the same problem-solving. It's all uh, thinking about, you know, does this scene go here? Does it work there? What, what about this character? Should she say this to him at this point? And, you know, it's just all part of the big puzzle and any kind of thing like that, if I get engaged in that, that's it for me. I, I, I want to do that. So I think that everybody kind of has to be multi-hyphenated, especially in the production side. I think that obviously people that are, you know, camera operators and DITs and, and things like this, it helps to be one thing. <laughs> because people know you for that and that's what you regularly get the work for. But on the production side, you know, producers can't always just wait for a writer to come and, and, and be the best writer ever. Like, they either have to start writing themselves or they have to know how to be a, a development producer and know how to cultivate talent and, and help them along and... Um, be able to not just get the money or whatever they have to be able to be creators as well so it's complicated to say where you are in the industry and what what's your job when you kind of try and do everything that you possibly can I went to university and studied film and obviously every single person that signs up to do a film undergrad degree that has any uh, semblance of practical wants to be a director why wouldn't anybody want to be? Because, you know, directors are always painted as, you know, the big head honcho, they get the chair, they get the they get to tell everybody what to do, and obviously the reality is slightly different. And then when it was into the third year, there were just ten of us, and uh, that was when I actually made a graduate film. That was the solidifying of, yeah, I want to do this, I can do this, and, uh, you know, all, all the kind of the arrogance with the naivety of like, yeah, this is great and we can do this. And and yes, it is partly the incubation of being in at university as opposed to being out in the real world. But it definitely was, you know, there was no doubt that this is what I wanted to do for my career. Fresh out of university, criminal audition was already brewing. Sam talks about his relationship with partner in crime, Luke Kale, and how they navigated the production process of the first feature film. The first real project that I got into uh, or directed after university was my first feature, Criminal Audition. And there is no real route to being a director, but people generally don't come out of uni and two years after uni someone says, do you want to direct a film? But that's what happened. Now, it's not to say that that wasn't with some naivety again and uh, some pluckiness and for Luke Kale uh, my producing partner to believe in me but that was six years ago so I had a lot of learning to do and a lot of time and uh, around that time I was also working as a script reader I met a lot of um, people that we ended up collaborating on a short film which really was the first project that I directed outside of, or, or, or big project that I directed outside of uni because me and Luke had started making shorts together, but they were really kind of training grounds for making Criminal Audition. And then 
I ended up doing the short only a few months before I did criminal audition. So I had this really big year of my first professional directing year. For criminal audition, Luke Kale, he came to me with the concept, which the concept is criminal audition. It's it's kind of like an X factor for people that want to be criminals. And it's set in this uh, one location over one night and people are auditioned to see how good of a criminal they could act like because they have to pretend to be criminals for a price and they, they'll they get financially rewarded for doing uh, prison time for, for people. But initially it wasn't just all in one place and it wasn't just over one night and it wasn't that kind of nice simple pitch there was a great concept at the core of it but we had a sprawling movie which was you know or a comparatively a sprawling movie so the process of criminal audition was basically mine and luke's film school so luke had this initial idea and wanted to make a movie and i was just so buoyed by the by not only the the concept of the film but also the idea that luke was just saying that I want to do a film. And so I, I, I love that. It's hard to put a number on it, but we, we, we did a lot of drafts and a lot of rewriting and it wasn't just new scripts, it was new people that we were working with, new people that we became friends with and then wanted to work with. It was a, a growing of mine and Luke's relationship. It was It was a change in all of our perspectives and... You know, we were gaining experience in other parts of the industry. Luke was working in a visual effects company and more like the production and account side. And I was working in development at another production company. So all these things were affecting how we were going to approach the film. And one of the last hurdles was we had one scene that was still outside. It still wasn't to do with just the main one night of the film. And it seemed at that point that maybe we should just do it all in one location. And uh, the majority of the film had always been set in this one location, but it was like, let's spare it down, let's do this. So then that made it clearer for how I was going to approach visuals of the film, the feeling of the film, and it became this Agatha Christie-like chamber piece that had thriller elements, but all the thrills were going to have to come from character and performance and the tension that we built over the night so it was it was all about the location and we spent a long time trying to find the right location and initially we were looking at different places to be and you know oh this part of this uh, pub looks good but uh, this part of this uh, function room or theater looks good where do we go and 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 then it just it just fell into place, as all these kind of things do, where we found a perfect location. It's called the Network Theatre. Essentially, it's under Waterloo Station in London. And it's brilliant because it's it's set underground and there's no windows. And so it meant that we didn't have to worry about light. We didn't have to worry about anything. We, did, we could just shoot, shoot, shoot. And we also used it as a unit base as well. And so... That really gave an energy to everything when we were shooting. It was that not only was I planning on ha- having this as a as this kind of Agatha Christie chamber piece and these people, uh, you know, exchanging words and trying to figure each other out and figuring out their their motives or their secrets. We were also doing that to each other because none of us had made a film together before, and we were all in this one location. And we were all getting along fine, <laughs> but we were almost in the same situation as the characters, except that we went home every day and, you know, et cetera. I don't know whether we'll, I'll ever catch that again with a film, but it was it was really useful for the mood of everything, was the the closeness. And we were, you know, elbow to elbow a lot of the time, and but it also helped that we were in a, uh, a theatre location which meant that we could rig lights and if some of the lights got in the shot it didn't necessarily matter because because they were lights in a in a theater it meant that we could really play with the theatrics of it 
and make it stagey in a cool way. Also having the one location we had different rooms that everything was set in. It was a practical thing, but it was also, I like films where I'm very familiar with the environment quite quickly. And so familiarity is in location is kind of like familiarity in theme or music. It's kind of like we're hearing this bit of music again. It reminds us again. So, oh, we're back in this room again, but it's a little bit different. And, you know, and so the rooms became characters in themselves. So the way that we designed the light, the colour, everything was so important because the location became a character in itself. And the two main aims of it was it to be this character piece this chamber piece that, you know, we were always second-guessing everybody's motives, everything that everybody said kind of sounded like a lie and we didn't know, and then also for them to be surrounded by this character-filled environment that we got so familiar with, and but we were always kind of second-guessing, next time we go to that room, what's it gonna, what's going to happen? Initially, the idea was to have it very much in a crime thriller trapping like maybe even like a british gangster kind of thing and, and i think the character of mo in the film is definitely left over from that he's he's almost like from like a british gangster film and he's transplanted in our slightly strange film um but uh you know we're gonna be like these other films but slightly different i don't think that it's ever helpful to just make a film for yourself or just make a film that's in your head because it's not always what people are going to want. You know, it's kind of like how you specifically, I don't know, make your, your, how you have your tea. Like not everybody wants that. Some people might like it, but you have to always think about the audience, whether you want to or not. But I think it's fun to think about what the audience want and also expect. It's kind of a challenge when you're writing to think about how, you know, a, a scene would work where, you have like there's a scene in our film which is almost like a romantic scene but it goes against the expectations of what people think that that would go down it really comes from thinking almost a bit mischievously about what are the audience going to expect and how am i going to pull the rug from under them wondering how to get the best out of your film sam gives us his thoughts i think a good film for me is Any film that shows me a world that I didn't think I knew before or that I really didn't know about before. The world, according to a French schoolgirl in an urban environment in France. I'm never going to ever experience that or understand that. But in a film like Girlhood, I'm able to understand that and at least see that and see that represented Also, films that don't talk down to the audience, films that aren't cynical and and are giving people what the filmmakers think they want rather than just allowing the story to play out and let everybody interpret it in their own way. Any film that asks questions and asks questions of the audience. I always think it's good when films uh, make you think afterwards. I know that usually what I say about a film is... Even if it is decently made and unoffensive and good acting in it and good writing, yeah, it was it was it was great. But I haven't thought about it since I saw it or anything like that. But if you just kind of keep going back to even just one scene or one theme in the film and just think that I just can't get out of my head, and that's usually what I think is is the best film. Now for some of Sam's tips for shooting, find yourself a script supervisor. I think that the challenges as an indie director are probably largely the challenges of any director, which is communicate your vision as eloquently as possible. It's always a distillation of your of your vision. And that that's just, I think, true of everybody. For an indie director, it's always going to be time, pressure, money. And I think the way to cope with that is be resourceful by telling the story with the camera as much as possible. What that essentially is a flowery way of saying is don't shoot too much coverage because you might think that you're covering yourself, but that has an economic and time effect. I mean, everything I've done has been quite low budget and time constrained, but I think this is just a good rule of thumb anyway, is that 
just don't do too many takes on on each thing. I think that as long as you're, you know, not most scenes aren't going to be one shot. So don't dwell on shots that aren't working or are dead or the actor's just not in the right place at that time. And I usually have a limit of four takes because the first take you're getting into it, it's essentially a rehearsal. Hopefully you've had time to block and walk them through it and do a bit of rehearsal before. If you haven't, that's that's the rehearsal. Shoot the rehearsal, as they say. Um, the second take, you're probably getting there, and it's probably the take. Uh, the third one definitely will be, and the fourth one, just leave that there for any technical possibilities and just to make people feel better. Sometimes actors will get nervous about what well, that was only just one take. It's like, you know, one take wonders, but that actually makes actors nervous and and other people on the set I imagine because it's like we actually only had one go at that a a good conscientious DP or camera operator will be like hang on did I was that right or a focus puller will say I just don't know and obviously you've always got playback but um, have a script supervisor on your film they are often overlooked they are often seen as almost a luxury and 100% have a script supervisor because they are thinking about everything that you might not be thinking about. You know, we did, we did days on Criminal Audition where we shot 42 slates or something, and there's no way that I'll get into an editing room and, A, <laughs> want to watch all those rushes, but, B, remember the take I liked. Because you can't second-guess yourself. And, yeah, maybe you'll remember or you'll change your mind, but there's no way you're going to remember that. But at the time, you do remember it, and you go, yeah, fine, that one. That's not all that a script supervisor does. A script supervisor also times every scene, because sometimes it's hard to grasp, okay, if it, a take is two minutes, does that mean the whole scene is two minutes, etc., etc.? And I remember my script supervisor, uh, Natasha, on uh, Criminal Audition, she was totting up all the scenes, how long all the, you know, they work out the average of how long a scene is, and they're totting it all up, and... I was just nervous, uh, so apprehensive every day until we got to a point where essentially we'd shot a film. We'd shot something over an hour and 20 minutes or whatever, and I thought, right, now we've got a film. <laughs> and uh, and that can be really reassuring, actually. Here Sam discusses his expectations versus the reality of the film industry. Just a heads up, it's never easy making films, but don't let that discourage you. I think the main things that I thought about the industry before was that it was hard to do that. There were lots of gatekeepers and people in your way, as it were, quote unquote. But essentially, as long as you had a good story, a good script, uh, there would be people willing to help you make it. And I don't think this is this is definitely not a bitter view of it. But if people don't know you and don't you don't have a track record, they have no reason to have trust in you. You know, a script, good scripts are good scripts, but it kind of isn't enough. And uh, there was a point where, uh, you know, about three years into the process, you know, there'd been people on the project and then they'd lost interest. It was at a point where it was just me and Luke. And I said to him, look, no one cares about us no one cares about this film but we do and that's what's important and so as long as we care about it we can make other people care about it I mean or or it can be infectious but they have to be the right people and um, I just don't think there's this moment where you wow this super producer that has all this money behind them And I don't really think those people exist either. So I think that even though people think there are gatekeepers, there are. But behind the gate isn't necessarily just all the money in the world and you can just make any film. So it's not that they're keeping that from you. It's just that it's also hard on that side. It's just the numbers are slightly different. And even if you've got a track record, it's hard to make a film. It's basically it's it's difficult wherever you are. And I know, and that's not to discourage people from doing it. It's just you just have to make peace with the fact that you're the one getting up every day fighting for your film. And it makes it easier when you have a partner, like I have Luke, 
it makes it easier if you have supportive family and friends, definitely. But you are the one that cares about it. Also, the other thing that I realised afterwards was the afterlife of a film is a lot longer than you think. You know, we're having our film released in the UK in October and the US in October. So I'm still living with this film. It's not just that we shot it, we cut it, it's out there and I forget about it. It's still there. And it's also an investment in the future because hopefully when we go on and make more films, people will be more interested in the back catalogue and people will still ask you about it and you'll still do interviews such as this about it. And, you know, it it doesn't go away. Um, You feel different about it. You might feel a bit further away from it or hate it now or you might love it more or something but it doesn't go away it's not like just done it stays with you and the life cycle of a film is a lot longer than i thought i asked sam about the importance of film festivals be specific with your choice and find your niche i I think that festivals are very important in indie film but any form of exhibition is important in independent film but don't, don't be precious about it because the important thing is people seeing your film. So if you're lucky enough to be able to have a mate who works at a screening rooms or something like this, just let people see it. We decided to apply to genre festivals and that would be my advice about festivals is be specific. With Crim Audition, I felt that the film was a midnight movie. It was a film to be enjoyed and watched by audiences, by fans of genre by anybody really but I knew that fans of genre and fans of horror would un- would get it and understand it first and probably want to see it first so we applied to a few and that included Fright Fest and they chose us to be in the first Blood Strand which is new directors they appreciate stories and filmmakers and they really do start careers and help careers get going. The guys at Fright Fest are fantastic. And so we were so lucky to get in there. And through that, we got a sales agent and our sales agent got our distribution. And then we we're in America and the UK and Korea and Scandinavia and all these places that, and Poland and, and, and things that you, you don't ever think is going to happen. But that was really the gateway for us. So for me to say that festivals aren't important would be wrong because they definitely are. But we only did one and luckily it was the right one. Choose the right ones. If your film is a World War I drama, I guarantee you there will be a war film festival somewhere. And... Even if it feels niche or not, it will have audiences and there will be people that appreciate war films. And so you want those people to be the first people to see the film, I think, because they are the fans of whatever, whatever genre, sci-fi, horror. They're always enthusiastic and they always want to tell people who aren't necessarily in that world about films that they're excited about. And I think that's what's important. To wrap things up, I asked Sam about his views on theatrical releases and video on demand, and also what else is in the pipeline for him. With Criminal Audition, we never thought we're going to have a big theatrical cinema run um, and it's going to be, you know, on the UK box office, and that's probably not going to happen. We, we're always going to do VOD, streaming, whatever comes our way, DVD and Blu-ray is still a big market depending on the genre and the country and etc. So we're all set for that. But I think that people still love the cinema and for good reason as well. And also the reason why I know that is because when you tell people that aren't in the industry or you know your aunts and uncles or whatever that you're making a film and they usually gauge whether it's a quote-unquote real film if it's in the cinema. And that's still the the over uh, overwhelming thought with people. Maybe it will change with younger people who uh, will consume entertainment in, in a different way, but I still think the theatrical experience is very important to a lot of people. I don't think the debate about it is that films aren't films unless they're in cinemas because, you know, 99% of films don't get made... And the 1% of the films that do get made, 80% of them aren't at cinemas, you know. So it's um, it, it's just the reality of it and it doesn't take away from them. And ultimately, 
in order for most people to keep making films, they have to only rely on, on, on VOD. And it is a very healthy market. Uh, there is no stigma with it. It's not like what straight to video used to be. It's not like what TV movie used to be or TV series used to be. You know, it is a different world, but I think it won't take away from theatrical. But theatrical is still kind of beyond the reach of a lot of independent filmmakers. Luke and I, we formed a new production company called Milk Him First. And um, our aim is to make films in, in the horror or thriller genre because I think that horror is a great place for allegory and to talk about things that we are sometimes too scared to talk about. Not everybody connects with very earnest, serious films that deal with difficult subjects. Those films are very important, but sometimes they want to see it in a different lens or, 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 or see it in a way that they don't necessarily know that they're seeing it. So, yeah, our next project is, uh, is going to be a, a horror film. And it's definitely a different kind of horror film. It's, it's definitely got a twist to it and it is dealing with difficult themes but it's also seeing that in the prism of a scary supernatural thriller um well we're a couple of proper drafts into the script and we're putting lots of things together and talking to people and and, and the last film has really opened the doors to that for us you know it's in a we're having conversations now that we didn't think we would ever have and we never had with the last film and so that's that's really encouraging it's going to have its own unique challenges because we are stepping up and we do are going to have more people to answer to and more people around us. But it is getting us through the door. That's all we wanted from, from this film. Everything else is, is a bonus. You know, we love the film and we want everybody to see it and we wish the whole world would see it. But from our career standpoint, even if it's just... People see the title uh, and the poster and the fact that it's 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 on demand somewhere and that means that they'll accept your meeting. That's enough. And so that's what's happened. Even without a release, we uh, were able to get meetings and, and we've just built up interest for the next film. It was enough to get people interested just that we'd made a film. Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed this episode. The aim for the podcast is to provide a platform for first-time filmmakers to tell their stories, share their thoughts, knowledge and views, but most importantly, support and encourage others to follow their dreams. If you enjoyed this podcast, make it known, spread the word, like it, rate it, share it in your social media channels, and don't forget to subscribe and join the Facebook group. Help filmmakers to make films and us to share their stories.